<laughs> I started, thought I would, uh, would start things off with a quiz, okay? Now, I'm not going to give you the answers to the quiz right now, but we have only four questions, and most of you should get all of these right. But at the end of the session, we will go back to quiz questions, and you can compare your answers uh, to it there. And the answers are on our web page. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, uh, yes, uh, somewhere. <laughs> so, when was it founded? Okay, the next one. Now, which uh, ARC field day transitioned almost immediately into a real emergency response? Because the, uh, uh, let me just make sure this is recording, because it, uh, Okay. Uh, and then, um, okay, and then there's the, the question of uh, which ARC YouTube video has been, uh, the, been viewed the most times. And we've got uh, Mars, we've got uh, Air Launcher Construction, we've got FT8, and we've got uh, You Can Do Surface Mount. And then uh, finally, about uh, uh, one of the club's more distinguished past members, uh, Harry, Harry Daniels of uh, W2HD. Uh, some, uh, some, some questions that may or may not be true about his life. Okay. So now you're ready for the real deal. Okay, we're going to go through, uh, through these topics. We're going to talk just a little briefly about the AARC. We're going to talk a little bit about the repeaters and nets. I can tell you that I had no idea actually where some of the repeaters actually were until I put this together. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and then uh, how we how we handle our meetings, uh, how we uh, the things we do for public service, the things we do for education, antenna team, emergency communications, and, and finish up with field day. So the. Uh, we have about 130 members. Uh, it varies, and as you know, we went up by about six, and, and in another month or two, we may have some people that haven't renewed, so we'll go back down again by probably six again. Um, you know where we where we meet, second Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. We have the uh, Monday night information net at 8 p.m. on our three late repeaters there. And the club was uh, was founded. This is a hint about a club, and you might have been asked, uh, when was the club founded? It was founded in 1962. And, uh, uh, and Ron was kind enough to send me the names of sort of current status of some of the four uh, founding members of the, of the club. John, that's on our website. Ron gave me Just it. about everything is on the it's website. That's page. where I got this information. I haven't been around that long. You know? uh, so, in terms of the organization of the club, it's, it's pretty conventional. This is not sort of wildly different than, than most uh, 501, 501c3 uh, uh, clubs in the sense that we have a uh, board of directors that consists of an executive committee of officers who are elected annually. And then we have uh, a set of uh, committee chairs that uh, or that. Uh, round out the board to 10 people, and those committee chairs are elected for terms of, uh, of uh, two years. Uh, and as you can see, we've got, uh, by the way, the color scheme on this is too terrible. Let me know, I'm colorblind. And PowerPoint said this was a good color scheme, and I'm it's personally not, skeptical. It's not bad. It's not bad, okay, good. It's good. worse. Okay, <laughs> yeah, thank, thankfully so. Uh, so we've got a, uh, uh, we've got, uh, we're going to talk about public service and, uh, and uh, some of the aspects of technical. Probably aren't going to talk too much about a state and, and public relations. But anyway, um, there are some things that are distinctive about the club. Uh, one of the things is that uh, uh, we were in 2011 the Dave Convention Club of the Year. Uh, so, yeah. And that actually, if I recall correctly, was the club of the year it was a fairly new position. I think we might have been the second or third. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. Oh, uh, you get it. It's, a, it's quite an honor to be recognized. 
Yeah. The, the other uh, thing also about the, the AARC is that it is a what is uh, called a special service club by the American Radio Relay League. This is a club that uh, that has uh, supports new hand development and training, public relations, emergency communications, technical advancement, and operating activities. And that also requires, I think, sixty percent of the members have to be a member of the AWRF, right? Which is why we always ask at renewal. Yeah, and and John, to to make a point. Uh, when I was president last year, it fell on me, but uh, we have to read. This is something that is audited and renewed every other year. So this isn't just a rubber stamp and then you have it for life. This is, you have to maintain a certain level of activity and compliance to remain, uh, once you become, to remain a special service club. And I think the first time we got it was like 1990, 1990. Oh. It was uh, John, uh, John Gray, the decision said. And you have to reapply every other year, but yeah, every every twenty four months. Bob took care of us in August. <laughs> okay, let's uh, uh, talk a little bit about repeaters. Okay, this is a, this is the map I came up with where the repeaters are, and I have to say I hadn't realized they were in quite such a good triangle around Charlotte. So I also heard was much uh, was much further to the south there. The um, the, the uh, sorry about the, the thing blocking that on the local screen. Well, in terms of the three repeaters, uh, probably the one that sort of is of, of most interest to the, the Vera group is going to be the 895 repeater. And that one uh, features both, that tower features both the 895 repeater and it also features a mid link. Uh, uh, a node as well, so that you can actually send email. If you could talk to the repeater, you could be sending email to that repeater as well. Uh, well, through that power, not through the repeater. <laughs> repeater, wing wing node, different things. Down at the Herd Mountain, I have absolutely no pictures of Herd Mountain because my understanding is it's hell to get there. Uh, but it has uh, the, probably the sort of oldest and most venerable frequency for the club, which is 146.760. It also features a uh, also a uh, 1.25 meter uh, node as well. And by the way, all three of these uh, uh, repeaters are linked together. So if anything that goes in on one should come out on all the others. Uh, and then... Uh, and then uh, the other one is the one in town, and that's at uh, that's at Martha Jefferson Hospital. Uh, that's uh, uh, up on Pan Tops, and I do have a have a picture there. Uh, there's the the antenna that's located in with a bunch of other antennas up on the roof of the main hospital there. And then this is uh, the a picture of the roof. Well, the right is the picture of the repeater equipment uh, again with the set of cans. To provide that uh, that precise tuning that you need. Now, relative to meetings, how the heck do we do meetings? <laughs> okay, well, we we do them both on Zoom and on uh, on uh, on live. We uh, during COVID, we sort of started doing the Zoom thing, and uh, some people found that the Zoom thing was the way they preferred it. We have some people that don't arrive at night. So having them there. So what we do is we have a good quality video camera that is uh, is used as the as the camera node for the the meeting room. So hopefully it's not too painful for the people on the other end. And then of course uh, we have a uh, Bluetooth speaker that's providing their audio to to us, uh, nice and loud, so we can we can hear it there. And that uh, that I think has been really sort of sort of very helpful there. Now. Club meetings tend to be a little on the formal side, so it's not necessarily a great opportunity to just sort of rub shoulders and pin gear around and you know talk about this and that, talk about stuff that's got nothing to do with ham radio. So for those, we do have some informal gatherings uh, on the second and uh, fourth Saturdays at the Panera and Barrett Road. We usually have an informal gathering, starts about 7:30, usually wraps up about 9:30. 
Come up by how many times? You show up at nine o'clock, you're bored, welcome. Uh, and you know, if you want to bring a little piece of the sled along to show off and, and discuss. Now that has been in the past, we've had times to where we have had, you know, 12, 15, four or more people at it. And to tell you the truth, that was a little too much. Right now we're tending to run more around five or six, and that's probably a little on the small side. So I encourage you to come by and don't don't be a stranger because it's what we made of it. And uh, like I say, it's informal. Got to get yourself a good cup of coffee, get yourself a pastry, sit back and talk a little ham radio. And if you don't like ham radio, complain about the weather. But <laughs> the uh, uh, but that's uh, that's there. And then there's also a Wednesday lunch, Wednesday lunch bunch. At this point, it's pretty much Zoom. And uh, Jim, what's the, is that still a very active or is that uh, is that very class? And I haven't been on that in a while. Yeah, it's like six people. So. Okay, so see, it's all well, like six people. Lunch itself. Um, yeah, I haven't done that. Okay. Um, if you go back in many years, we get together and it was on Wednesday. It was a big place in the old little Django, little Django restaurant on 29 of Ohio. And there were times when we would fill that restaurant up at 1130 and 1230. We had a giant presence on that. And um, every once in a while, somebody who wasn't part of the radio called us. They did um, and it's got it's shrunk over the years. It's a, it's sort of right now the same group, but we use the same Zoom link that you're using for the meetings right now. So that's that's available. Um, that is correct. Right? Yeah. yeah. So so I would encourage uh, anybody here who got nothing else to do and kind of love to talk about Wednesday to, to check in. Uh, uh, and we have it added right now. So it's pretty much a regular group. So you just going to wait for the whole thing. Yeah. But yeah, we'd love to have more of you come. Love to have a long time Wednesday. And it's Zoom to sit there in your office, sit there in your Yeah. Yeah. So we've got one right now, Panera is only in person. And right now, the Wednesday one is only Zoom. Uh, we had been doing duplicate uh, Zoom on Panera and on uh, uh, Panera Zoom and not. But the truth be told, it was really hard to coordinate Zoom on a phone with people standing around, sitting around the table. So we're sort of divvying them up there. But anyway, I encourage you to, to participate in those. Now, one of the things that I think may be fairly distinctive among the clubs in the area is that we uh, record a lot of our presentations. This presentation hopefully is being recorded and, uh, and then it will uh, reside on our club YouTube channel. And I've uh, pulled up some of the most popular ones here. Uh, we've got the Mars ones that has, uh, has 22, over 2,200 views. And I will add, though, that the uh, FTA for Field Day has uh, over 2,100 views. Uh, and then our Tater Cannon Launcher, Jim, I'm sorry, you're way behind. You're only 1,500 views. I will say that most of them rack up. Well, obviously, there's a time thing, because these say this is some deeper from a couple of years ago. But uh, Normally, you'll see, you know, maybe 50, 75, 100. Some of them are sort of in the three to 500 range. And then we have some that sort of creep up into the, into the high things. But it's, uh, I, I like to think that that's something nice that we're doing for the rest of the ham radio uh, community there. So what's our top one? It used to be Bill O'Less. It, it still is. It's still the bar. wonderful creep. Yeah, no, but really it is. It's a, it's a top one. Uh, we all also do get together to uh, to hand out awards. So here's uh, uh, K4BAV's uh, photos from the uh, from the uh, the most recent awards banquet. It was really great to sort of pull that in person again after it was our first one post COVID. We completely filled the space that we had available, but uh, 
it was a, a, a good time was had by all, I believe. John, did you leave out the picnic? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I didn't leave out the right. picnic, so I will, I will add that. Yes, I will add the picnic. I need pictures of the picnic. That, that, that was part of the criteria there. We need to have pictures. Um, okay. But yeah, the picnic is a is a is a good good point. And I know Jim Jim's got some pictures Jim there, and he's writing down to give them to me. The uh, yeah, and they, a good time was had by all, especially our president, who seemed to win all the raffle items. <laughs> I don't know what three radios. Hey boy, took that. Anyway, well, it was not fixed. But anyway, uh, public service uh, we uh, provide uh, support. Primarily to uh, bicycle touring events and and a limited number of uh, of uh, foot events. Uh, the largest recent event was the uh, uh, ride to defeat ALS, which involved uh, 22 hams last year and was done on the same day as a as a foot event. Uh, so that uh, we actually had uh, had uh, had two hams that were working two public service events in one day. And for that reason, they won the Public Service Award on the left there. <laughs> that, not only that reason. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and also, uh, we have club members who, whether formally or informally associated with the club, help out also with surrounding events. So it just be, we are just strictly in Albemarle County. We have some events that we help out sometimes with Tour de Green. We've helped with, with the Rockford Gravel Grinder. We, we've worked with uh, with several others as well. Uh, but those are always uh, always fun events. This is our was our setup a couple of years ago at uh, at the headquarters of the ALS event with uh, with two count them two masks for uh, VHF antennas. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and two separate setups so that we were monitoring, I think uh, about four different frequencies at any given time. Yes, we needed headphones at some times because there was so much stuff going around. And this event also makes a lot of use of simplex. So if you're out on the courts, a lot of that coordination is actually done with that. This is, when you got 22 hands, not everybody can talk at once. So we really have to have some frequency discipline on this stuff. And people have been really good about it, and it's a great way to learn how to use radio. Uh, going on the education committee, uh, we run uh, typically a couple of hand courses a year. We typically run, based on the past few years, two or three technician courses for every general course that we run. So far, we haven't run any extra courses because we have looked at the book, and that's a thick book. <laughs> uh, and at that point, also, as as uh, as uh, uh, one of our our board members who sh shall remain nameless, except to say that it's Dave Damon, uh, <laughs> always says that your your ham license doesn't mean that you finished your ham education; it means you can start your ham education. Uh, it's, it's your license to learn. So uh, anyway, uh, currently we've been running those courses via Zoom, and that seems to be working out well because we're also getting people who are not just in the immediate area who are also also interested. But there's always uh, some back and forth in terms of whether or not a course should be in person or, or Zoom. Uh, we also have uh, VE sessions. We do four VE sessions at least per year. And uh, basically every uh, every 30 days or every 60 days, I'm sorry, oh, no, excuse me, every 90 days, four per year, 90 days. Uh, and then but we will sometimes also have some special sessions that are associated with uh, with uh, classes. Uh, and we typically have eight to 11 um, members of the club who serve as volunteer examiners uh, during those, those sessions. And we also have a larger number of people who are VE. Right. We, right. <laughs> these, are, these are for the number of VEs who work as VE, yeah, yeah. but we have other people that are VE qualified. For those of you who might be interested in becoming VE qualified, it's it's a question of mostly they tell you read a read a manual, take a test, 
what they actually advise is take a test and you know, look through the manual to answer the questions. Uh, it's a, a bit novel approach, but once you have completed the test, you will become a VE. Even uh, even technicians can become VEs for, but they can only serve on technician tests, right? Do I have that right or do yeah, exactly. Okay, I'm right. So don't, 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 you're not quoting on that. If you have, I think the minimum is a general. Okay, sorry about that. If you, if you have a general, you can do, do it all. And you have to renew it, and you have to yeah. You have to remain active. Like you can't renew it if you never served as a VE right. for the past several years. Yeah, they do keep track of all that stuff. Yeah, sorry about that. If I got the, all of you technicians excited about giving everybody else exams, but that's okay. General or upgraded extras. Yeah, no, well, yeah, once you upgrade the extra, it's easy. Um, one of the other things we do that's sort of unusual, and then and thanks for Larry for pointing this out to me uh, just, just earlier today, was uh, for outreach, we try to put ham radio magazines in the local library. Uh, right now, the Northbridge, the North uh, North Side branch of the uh, library has both QST and On the Air, the two ARRL magazines, uh, available for the general public and for any camps who want to who are not yet ARRL members. Another uh, thing that the club does is uh, we have the antenna team. One of my favorite photos ever, because you can actually see the little tater flying out of the tater can. And the middle, it's a it's a a, uh, it's a, a plastic plug, but uh, but uh, uh, we can put things over things over 150 feet high. Uh, and, and Jim is just an absolute uh, absolute dead eye with it. Um, and basically, what the antenna team does is helps him put up the him put up their equipment. The ham is responsible for providing the equipment, uh, for making sure that they have all the cables, all the stuff that's going to be needed, and then the antenna team will come and help them erect the antenna, get it up, uh, get it working, get it tested. Uh, we've got, uh, for getting things over over trees, we've got our tater cannons, we've got our uh, slingshots, we've got our arborist throw bags, we've got the uh, Weighted ball, weighted uh, um, lacrosse balls. We've got all sorts of things for trying to get things over. But we've also got people that have had sort of a lot of experience with how do you get the darn lines around all those tree branches that are that are getting in the way of it as well. It isn't just as easy as oh, we'll just throw a line over a tree. Sometimes there's a little negotiation about. What do you do about the trees that are in the middle of things like that? And we also helped out the uh, the local Red Cross in putting up an antenna. That's what's in the lower right there. It's not so good, but that's basically a, a case where this was a, a rubber roof. And so what we did was help them put up a, uh, a square of wood on top of that roof that we could then mount the antenna on. Now, this may be something we'll be revisiting at some point because they moved out of that building. So that antenna was taken down and the, it, right now it's sort of in storage in Richmond, but it, it may come back when they figure out where the new building is. They don't know yet. Um, the antenna team also does, you know, we'll go out and do a site survey and advise the member what antenna material to buy, what type of antenna to use, et cetera. Well, we don't install towers. We assist members. That's right. Yeah, yeah, we do We do not have a tower kind of climbing core. But we, uh, that, we'll, we'll we will be the ground crew. Yeah, we, we decided that that's not, not something we're going to do. Now, one of the things that is that the moving on to sort of emergency communications, excuse me, the, the club does not have sort of a formal relationship with the Aries Racies group, apart from the fact that all the members of the local Aries Racies group are also members of the club. Okay, but they are two separate entities. They, they, the Aries group is its own thing. It doesn't get funding from the club and, and things like that. Um, one of the things
things also that several members of the club have also been working with is the uh, uh, Northwest uh, Regional Healthcare Coalition. This is a, a network of hospitals, and they have installed a standard suite of gear in each of the member hospitals. So you can see Dave Damon there with uh, with the cabinet that contains the gear for the, the Northwest Region uh, unit at Martha Jefferson Hospital. And one of the things that's distinctive about that is we've had in the past times where we had equipment all over the place. You know, there was and there were these radios here, and those radios there, and those radios there, and those radios there. Well, what's different about this is these are used every week for an exercise. Okay, these are not radios that are sitting in a closet that you hope will be ready when there's a problem. These are radios that are being tested for sending uh, uh, mostly uh, wavelength messages because to tell you the truth, if you're exchanging information about very important things, probably you don't necessarily want to be using voice. You might want to be using some text. Uh, and so uh, uh, they do a lot of work with that. Uh, Vera also does, I think, some things, certainly some Vera members do with it, because one of the, uh, the, the Augusta Hospital is, is one of the things there. But this is something also where if you want to, uh, to do this, uh, um, we have uh, Leroy, who's sort of the primary person at Martha Jefferson Hospital, with, uh, along with Dave Damon. And then we have uh, Lauren Chan for LYF, who's the lead guy for UVA. And then we've got that K4 UEK, our, our, our stealth plan over in the valley, who's, uh, who's doing it for the Augusta Medical Center. And I think they should be able to work out something if you would like to, to come and sort of see it in action and then maybe even get involved with uh, the building and thing. Hey, John. Yeah. Uh, we, we also have a reference uh, at Western State Hospital. Okay. And they are allowed to leave most of the time. Uh, <laughs> it's a mental hospital. Yeah, um, yeah. And the other thing I would mention is the. NWR has been replaced by NBERS inverse. So okay. NWR was absorbed, and I can get you. Okay. okay yeah. If you can, if you can, if you yeah. can get me that, that would be great. This was working off the press release for the the fifty second uh, anniversary yeah. of uh, Martha Jeff being in action there. The uh, now one of the questions that I had asked you was uh, what field they had something unusual happen shortly thereafter. And that was 1995. Field day uh, ran June 24th and 25th. One day to sleep, and then on the 27th, Madison County had, uh, had uh, 20 inches of rain in 10 hours. And if you are looking at that black and white picture in the upper right, that is the south, uh, the northern side of the bridge for the southbound lane of Route 29. That is southbound Route 29 going over the Rapidan River at the Madison Green County line. And that's it after the water went down, because you couldn't see any of this when the water was up. But what happened was that, uh, that the uh, Basically, what happened was that uh, on uh, some of our members had not taken all their gear out of their truck. And so they got a call that, that something bad was happening, happening up in Madison. And by the way, nothing bad was happening in Charlottesville. So the folks at the emergency center were going, say what? Beautiful days, <laughs> skies are clear, not a problem. Up in Madison, they were having trouble. So basically, they ran up there and, and set up at the uh, at the emergency headquarters up there. Well, currently, let's see, did we just lose, uh, well, let's see. For some reason, one of the screens just blanked, but I think the other one's okay. Um, we're, uh, they uh, went and uh, set up an 80 meter HF antenna out there and used that to communicate with Richmond because this was pre-cell phone or at least a very, very early cell phone. And so they were, helping to call in helicopters for search and rescue missions. They were uh, uh, providing information for the Red Cross. And you can see there were uh, there were three or four hands that were sort of primary, but what I did was just pull out of the, 
1995 beacon, the list of all the call signs of the of the people. Um, and and I'm, I will pull out uh, some of the names on that. I know uh, uh, Pete Wildman was one of the one of the folks who was was heavily involved with that. I'm still trying to figure out what the heck the uh, call sign. Here the heck the call sign. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, maybe it's not maybe it's not on here. There's, there's one that was like AB4TU, and I did not for the life of me find any record of that in FCC databases. <laughs> it could be a silent cage. Uh, well, no, I think that I think it may be Pete Wild on them. I think he just changed his call sign letter. But anyway, it's, it's uh but uh but that's an example of sort of arc field day gone gone major. Uh, they got also they did come out actually the day after that on the twenty on the twenty eighth because they were concerned about the overflow in Sugar Hollow Reservoir. Fortunately, did not pan out as emergency, but we had people on site just in case, and that's what a lot of it's about. Now, field day, uh, we uh, uh, do a, uh, a fairly uh, a fairly extensive field day with an education. We've got multiple tents. Uh, uh, in this particular year, we were set, we also set up a, a hex beam as, bunch, as well as a bunch of wire antennas. We typically operate as a uh, 3A station, which is basically three transmitters. Typically, one of those is dedicated to CW, one to phone, and one to uh, the digital. But we have flexibility on that. So sometimes we might have a couple of phone stations operating at CW, and then later on have a, have a digital station and two phone stations or, or so forth. Always glad to have people there. Uh, one of the things that was really exciting this year was the educational activity because they did a transmitter hunt. So in the lower right, what you see are actually some young potential future hands whose faces hopefully have been sufficiently obscured, uh, uh, working on actually building uh, directional antennas for use in a uh, transmitter hunt, a fox hunt. And they went and did that. But we've had a, a variety of things that we've got. It would not, no picture of field day would be complete without Rich down in the bottom, our greeter, who welcomes everybody who comes to the site. And then, uh, and then we've got uh, uh, some, some people operating, including Dennis, actually tuning something instead of actually hitting the key, his, uh, his Morse code key all the time. So you're ready for the quiz. Yeah. Okay. 1962 was when the club was founded. But Ron Ritchie, you joined right afterwards, correct? Because I saw your name in a real old. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the year that was uh, the weird field day thing was, uh, was 1995. The, uh, the, our biggest uh, hits are hit was the Mars one with Bill Alessi and the Paul English. And, uh, but the others were, like I say, quite respectable. I, I shuffled them around just a little bit. And then the, the one on surface mount there, by the way, was a bit of a ringer. It's not one of our highest rated ones, but boy, it was just so yes. cool. Uh, you know, take a toaster oven and convert it into a surface mount oven for developing your own boards. Just, just me. And of course, for everybody in the everybody who's been in the club for a while, you know that all of the above was the answer for this one. Harry was uh, head of the ARRL for 10, 10 years. He was a emeritus, both that and the quarter century wireless club. And he reportedly could do 50 words per minute. CW when he was 10 years old. And he served in World War II. Yeah, but served served in World War II. And he used to tell the story that he was the only person that when he went into the Navy, his family left him. They were in Panama. He was going to high school with the males on his dad was the commander of the naval base and then he enlisted and then his dad got transferred. And so the whole family, except for Harry, left the canal zone. He stayed there as a radio operator. But I, I hear have heard lots of stories of the fact that Harry would be sitting there next to it, next to a, 
uh, radio and it'd be going away with CW and he'd be chatting with you about this or that. He'd just say, okay, yeah, we were doing that. <laughs> when I became a ham in 1964, I was 14 and Harry was the director for the Hudson. Hudson and he visited every local club in New York and New Jersey. And when he became president of the ARL, he visited at least a club in every state. And also several countries. 